Good day to you, and welcome to another virtual program from the Konica Jig Institute. This week's virtual program is the first of many on 18th century medicine and surgery. This forms part of one of our major school programs combining history and science with some entertainment and grossness. Many people, when they think of doctors and medicine in colonial America, have a few preconceptions. Crazy remedies, lots of blood, amputations all over the place, and leeches. Some of this is true, but the 18th century was also a time of enlightenment, science, and discovery. And in these videos, we hope to bring to light some of those facts, why those crazy remedies worked, and how sometimes a little bit of cutting does a lot of good. But first, let's delve into who were these physicians and surgeons. A medical man in the 18th century could easily be distinguished by a specific look. Black coats were the fashion for men of medicine for centuries, and so a black suit was the normal uniform. These clothes would be worn during surgery too, though it was common to take the coat off and tie the sleeves for ease and wear an apron. A white physical wig was another key visual indicator of the medical man, as was a cane, often brass tipped or with a pomander of smells in the tip. You could tell a doctor by his dress, just like today we see the doctor's uniform and know that it's someone who can heal us. Becoming a full physician required about eight years of study, either at universities, by attending lectures and dissections, or in an apprenticeship. This meant that usually it took some money to become a doctor, though there were exceptions. General John Forbes, who was famous for leading the British against the French during the French Indian War, studied as a physician in his youth before deciding that he was made for war. Another famous Scots medical man, with major ties to this area is Hugh Mercer. Mercer was a surgeon with the army of Bonnie Prince Charlie during the Scottish Rising of the 45. After the rebel defeat, Mercer, like many others, came to America where he made a new life for himself. He served as a Pennsylvanian officer during the French Indian War, kept an apothecary shop nearby, travelled around as a doctor, possibly even to Rockhill Farm to where the Davises lived, before ending his life heroically during the American Revolution. Again, like in modern times, there were different types of doctors in the 18th century with different specialities. One surgeon may be a particularly good tooth drawer, or perhaps a doctor is especially good at lithotomies, perhaps another makes the very best enemas. In the earlier century, physicians, those who diagnose and prescribe, were separated from the barber surgeons, those who do the mechanical cutting, and there was a clear line and a distinction between them in terms of wealth and prestige. But by the mid-18th century, this line had blurred, largely due to William Chesildon. Chesildon was born in 1688 in Leicestershire, England. Apprenticed as a surgeon, he learned anatomy from William Cowper, who gave the country's first private lectures on the subjects. Cowper was just a simple bone setter, but he had a burning passion for the human body, and through dissections he discovered new things such as the small glands at the base of the bladder, still known today as Cowper's glands. His passion infected Chesildon, who went on to lecture, dissect bodies on his dining room table, and ultimately separate the surgeons from the barber society, thus setting surgery on a higher footing. Today though, let's focus on just one operation trepanation or skull boring. While this may be a popular 18th century surgery, this is one of the world's oldest recorded surgeries, with skulls with holes bored in them dating back as far as the Mesolithic era, making it a 12,000 year old practice. But why make a hole in a skull? Over the centuries, it has had different uses, to treat the sickness of the mind, to let the demons out. Some of these are not as scientific, from a medical standpoint though, and in our case, it is to save the life of someone who's had a skull fracture. Let's say this skull here, if it was alive, had been hit on the head with a club. The skull was fractured, perhaps with some depressed bone. The fluid will build up between the skull and the brain. Blood clots can form, all of which can crush the brain, causing brain damage and death. Trepanation is the answer. First, identify where the fracture is. Then take a scalpel and make an incision in the scalp, clear through the epidermal layer. Next, take your attractors and pull back the scalp, exposing the skull underneath. Depending on the size of the fracture and shape, you may want to use a small hay saw. 
but a trephine is the standard tool. A trephine is essentially a circular saw with a center point. Placing the trephine in the center of the fracture, as you turn, the saw drills through the skull. Don't apply too much pressure, as you could push through near the end and puncture the patient's brain, resulting in death. Carefully lift the trephine out, removing the disc of skull. You then take a scalpel and slice through the dura mater, the thin layer that separates your skull and brain. Fluid from swelling can now drain, preventing brain damage. Pack the wound with lint and toe and bandage, and when drainage is complete, sew the scalp back together. Of course, you now have a hole in the head. The human body is marvelous, though. If young, the skull can re-knit itself as the body grows. In an older patient, sometimes a metal disc was hammered onto the skull to cover it up. Sometimes the holes in the skull were just left as is, and you hope no one poked you in your soft spot. One thing we forgot to mention, as it will be another program in itself, is that there was no anaesthetic in the 18th century. So all of this was done while the patient was awake, feeling every cut, the sound and the grind of the skull being bored into, feeling the cool air on the brain. Ugh. Anyway, we have so many facets of this fascinating subject to cover, Comment to see what aspect of colonial medicine you would like to learn about. From apothecaries and where medicine comes from, the truth of bloodletting and who it killed, Chesseldon's perennial lithotomy, leeches, why do they suck, and the plain old why amputations. Thank you for joining us on another virtual program, and we hope you join us for another soon.